day, my dear students. You've tuned into Your Menopause Your Way, and you probably already know that I'm Menopause Taylor, the gynecologist who teaches you absolutely everything about menopause. This is video 263 in the entire menopause education, and it's the 28th video in the unit on Alzheimer's disease, which began way back in video 236. Last week, I gave you the first video on your dietary options for preventing Alzheimer's. Today, I'm going to give you the second video on dietary options, and it will be a spin-off of the one I gave you last week. One of the worst things you can do for managing your menopause is watch my videos out of order. It will sabotage your entire menopause education. <laughs> last week, I presented four factors determining your dietary options for preventing Alzheimer's. But mostly, I posed questions for you to ponder. A large part of this education is for you to decide things for yourself. I don't tell you what to do. I don't tell you what I do. I teach you principles so that you can do what's best for you with confidence and facts. But nowadays, there is so much hype and so many fads that lead you astray. So I make sure to address them as we go along. And as usual, I do not do so in a way that substitutes my judgment for your own judgment. I do so in a way that helps you separate facts from marketing and advertising. You see, I don't care how you manage your menopause. I care that you know what you're doing. If you have my book, and I hope you do, all of chapter 33 is on Alzheimer's disease in both the first edition and the second edition. But today's lesson isn't a standalone topic in the book, so you definitely need to watch this video. Last week, in video 262, Several factors set the stage for this video. They included all of the following. How frequently you eat, how regularly you eat, how much you eat, and how many calories you consume daily. If you examine that list of four factors, you realize that they fall into just two categories of concern with regard to your food intake. Frequency and quantity. So I want to focus on just frequency and quantity of food intake in this video to compare and contrast the significance of the two on your brain. Now, you know I don't generalize. I give you facts that are very specific to the topic at hand. So regardless of how frequency or quantity of food may affect other aspects of your life, Everything I tell you today is specific to their effect on your brain. So basically, we are going to address intermittent fasting versus calorie restriction. So let's dive into it. Last week, I told you that because your brain uses 20 to 25% of your body's energy, you have to consider how long your brain can go before it runs out of fuel. Although we humans start out eating every two hours, we voluntarily and arbitrarily change that two-hour interval to a much longer interval of about six or seven hours. Humans are the only animals on Earth who voluntarily decrease their frequency of eating. The other factor tied in with how frequently you eat is how regularly you eat. This pertains to the fact that your body has a rhythm that is tied to its need for food. So your body lets you know it's in need of fuel by making you hungry at certain times of day in a predictable pattern. Your frequency of eating is all about the circadian rhythm of your body's energy needs. Rhythm is an innate characteristic of all living things. It's always determined by the life cycle of the living thing, whether it be a plant or an animal. Plants know when to bloom. Some open their petals in the morning and close at night. And all animals have a built-in program for when they eat. Cows graze all day, all day. Lions hunt every two or three days, and they only eat every two or three days. So this rhythm 
circadian rhythm is determined by Mother Nature. And anything that is determined by Mother Nature is very difficult to change. Of course, we humans are the only animals on Earth who would even consider attempting to, ch to fight Mother Nature or change anything that she's designed. And despite all, all our attempts, nothing we do is ever, ever as good as what Mother Nature can do. <laughs> you know, every time I meet a woman with curly hair, <laughs> I ask her, so, when did you stop fighting your hair? And then we always break out into gales of laughter because our stories are always the same. How Mother Nature can produce hair like this I don't know. Well, actually, I do know. It's all about disulfide bonds, but every girl with curly hair spends about half of her life fighting it. We use blow dryers, huge curlers, straightening irons, chemical straighteners, you name it. But no matter what we do, it never looks as good as what Mother Nature created. And eventually, when we're about 30 or so, <laughs> we finally realize that we will never, ever win this battle against our curly hair. So the lesson is that you will never win any fight against Mother Nature. So when it comes to how frequently and regularly you are supposed to eat, that's a product of Mother Nature. And one of the main reasons you need to eat frequently and regularly is that your brain requires it. So anytime you don't eat frequently or regularly, you are fighting Mother Nature. Now, you might get away with it for a while or you might get away with it for a long time. And you may see positive effects in certain aspects of your body or your life. But what happens to your brain? So let's address the frequency and the quantity of your food intake separately. First is frequency. Currently, one of the big fads of our time is intermittent fasting. Most people who promote intermittent fasting market it as a means of accomplishing many things. Among them are greater longevity, faster weight loss, lower risk of diabetes, lower risk of heart disease, and improved Cognition. Whenever you see a long list of attributes like that, notice that they all indicate a relative benefit. But relative to what? All we care about for purposes of this video is the effect of intermittent fasting on your brain. So the claim that intermittent fasting improves cognition makes me ask, compared to what? Now just stop for a moment. Forget everything you've heard from marketers on intermittent fasting. If I said that going without food will make you think better, would that sound logical to you? Does your brain function better when you're hungry? And does it depend on how hungry you are? If you fast for days on end, will your brain function better and better the longer you fast? I don't know about you, but when I'm hungry, I'm so distracted by my hunger that I can't think at all. Doesn't hunger serve the purpose of letting you know when your body and brain need fuel? But notice that the claims about the benefits of intermittent fasting are many. You see, there's a tendency to lump a lot of positive claims together without designating the specific factors that affect each one individually. And it turns out that the studies that were done on the effects of intermittent fasting used people who had diabetes. But the reporting of benefits neglected to mention that. And the problem is that neglecting to mention that changes everything. Diabetics have a problem with insulin metabolism that in turn causes a lot of other problems, including cognitive problems. So the effect of fasting on a diabetic brain will be different than the effect of fasting on a non-diabetic brain. And no matter whether you have diabetes or not, your brain really just wants to be fed every couple of hours. The key is to feed it the right kinds of foods. And of course, that is left out of the discussion completely by anyone pushing intermittent fasting. Another 
thing that is always left out of marketing for intermittent fasting is menopause. Menopause itself slows down your metabolism. That means your body processes food more slowly. Well, Mother Nature made it so that a slow metabolism makes your body think it's starving. And your body's response to starving is to store more calories as fat. Intermittent fasting also slows down your metabolism. That's because your metabolic rate is intricately tied to your frequency of food intake. If you eat frequently, your metabolic rate will be fast. If you eat infrequently, your metabolic rate will be slow. And once again, a slow metabolic rate means that your body stores more calories as fat. So for a menopausal woman, uh, that would be you, <laughs> intermittent fasting is a double whammy to your body's tendency to store more calories as fat. Another effect of menopause is that it, that is always left out of any marketing for intermittent fasting is the effect of menopause itself on your brain. What's one of the most common symptoms of estrogen deficiency? Brain fog, mental fog, fuzzy thinking, etc. In essence, estrogen was fuel for your brain. Without it, your brain does not function efficiently. And frequent food intake is fuel for your brain too. Without it, your brain does not function efficiently. So as a menopausal woman, if you are absent both of these two brain fuels, you end up with a brain that is ripe and ready for Alzheimer's. You absolutely must apply everything you hear to your menopausal body. If you don't, you will make all sorts of terrible choices. And that's because menopause changes everything. The bottom line, though, is that any kind of interruption in the built-in frequency and regularity of your body's need for food constitutes a fight with Mother Nature. Your brain and body just love rhythm. I guess you could say that intermittent fasting isn't any more beneficial than intermittent sleeping. So you might get away with it for a while, but your brain will keep score. And any short-term benefits may not continue to be beneficial in the long term. And the ultimate outcome for your brain will be that your brain suffers. As I told you in last week's video, there is no protocol for what constitutes intermittent fasting. Most people just make up their own definition. Some people postpone breakfast by a few hours so that their overnight fast lasts 12 hours or more. Some eat breakfast and then fast all day until dinner time. Others fast every other day. Still others fast one day a week. There are endless modifications and none of them is agreeable to your brain. Here's how intermittent fasting looks on our chart for brain buildup and brain breakdown. So the lesson here is that decreasing the frequency of your food intake does not decrease your risk of Alzheimer's. It actually increases it. But let's consider another aspect of intermittent fasting, which is about food quantity. One of the ultimate goals of intermittent fasting is to limit your food quantity. So this is about decreasing how much you eat. And there are two ways to accomplish that. One is by focusing on the food in terms of mass, and the other is by focusing on the food in terms of calories. They are not the same to your body or your brain. They both adhere to the underlying principle of calorie restriction, but you don't go about them in the same way. If you restrict the quantity of food you eat in terms of mass, you can eat anything. You just have to limit how much of it you eat. So cake is fine as long as you only have a bite or two. If you limit the quantity of food you eat in terms of calories, you can still eat anything, but the calorie content determines the actual mass of the food you eat. So you can restrict calories by skipping meals and disrupting the frequency and regularity of your food intake, or you can restrict calories without skipping meals 
and without disrupting the frequency and regularity of your food intake. You have to separate frequency from quantity. They are not one and the same. Not in terms of how you accomplish them or in terms of what they do to your brain. You could just eat a few high calorie foods or you could eat a lot of low calorie foods and end up consuming the same number of calories either way. So if you limit your calories to 1800 calories daily, you could have pancakes for breakfast, a Big Mac fries and milkshake for dinner, or you could have oatmeal for breakfast, followed by an apple mid-morning, then a quinoa salad at lunch, a handful of nuts in the early afternoon, salmon and grilled veggies for dinner, and some soy yogurt in the evening. So restricting calories does not necessarily mean restricting food frequency, regularity, or mass. It just depends on what you choose to eat. Now, why am I making these distinctions? I haven't really told you much of anything you don't already know. Well, it's because these different alternatives have very different effects on your brain with regard to preventing Alzheimer's. It has long been known that eating less contributes not only to longevity, but also to a decreased risk of Alzheimer's. But how you eat less is the key. Eating fewer calories prevents Alzheimer's. So decreasing the quantity of your food intake does prevent Alzheimer's. Disrupting your brain and body's need for frequent regular fuel does not. And the difference goes back to the fact that one constitutes fighting mother nature while the other one does not. Nothing that constitutes fighting mother nature will ever be more beneficial than detrimental. It will always be a battle that you cannot win in the long run. This is true regardless of whether you're fighting your hair, your need for sleep, or your need for food. So let Mother Nature be your guide. If you limit your calories, it causes your brain to build up, as I discussed in video 262. But if you increase the intervals of time between your meals, it causes your brain to break down. Here's our chart depicting the effect of calorie restriction by means of eating frequent meals, but with fewer calories. So eating too many calories is bad. Eating none at all is bad too, but eating enough to survive and thrive and not so much that your body is in overdrive is excellent. So eat enough to survive and thrive while avoiding eating so little as to deprive or so much as to cause overdrive. The key is to do things that have more benefits than detriments, but sometimes marketers take things too far. They tell you to do things that tip into the detriment zone. I just point out where the line between the two is. Do you see the difference? If not, why don't you do an experiment on your own brain and let it tell you which is better. Your experiment will entail three two-week phases. First, try intermittent fasting for two weeks. Second, try calorie restriction that involves skipping meals and just eating one or two big meals each day. Do that for two weeks. And then at third, try calorie restriction that involves eating lower calorie foods every two hours all day long for two weeks. See how you perform mentally with each method. Your own brain will tell you what it prefers. So when it comes to your dietary options for preventing Alzheimer's, one of them is calorie restriction. But to gain the benefits, you must eat frequently, avoid disrupting the circadian rhythm of your meals, and eat a lot of lower calorie foods rather than just a few high calorie foods. In essence, decrease the quantity, but not the frequency of your food intake. So this video is purely technical. I told you nothing about the actual foods that are good for preventing Alzheimer's. But that's what I'll do in the next video and the one after that and a few more down the line. Each one will address a different food category or principle pertaining to Alzheimer's preventing foods. I know these videos deliver information to you very slowly, but I can assure you 
that you will not find this information broken down with this kind of specificity anywhere else. Instead, you will find merging of the concepts of fasting and calorie restriction and blurring the differences between the two. For your brain, that will be a disaster. So bear with me as I give you these videos one by one, ensuring that you have the precise information you need. It's the truth and it's the whole story. So this is where I'll leave you. Come back next week to learn about antioxidant and anti-inflammatory foods for preventing Alzheimer's. If you don't wanna to wait to get information from these videos, just schedule a consultation at menopausetaylor.me. I'll address everything directly and tailor it all to you. If you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and I will see you next time. <laughs> Bye.